And we might be that, you know, that weird guy sitting in the corner talking to himself. But when actions impose, uh, uh, yeah, just like that, good definition. <laughs> no, he's talking to his phone, man. We're not, he's not talking to himself. The man in the phone. Um, but when actions are brought into the picture, if one's actions are outside of normal or cause injury to others or cause others to be fearful, that's when we really do conjure up the definition of sanity. If somebody might talk about harming himself or actively tries to harm himself or tries to harm other people, that's where the sanity flag raises its head. And um, I sort of deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis about people who have potential homicidal or suicidal actions. We talk about ideations. And as a physician, you know, that puts me in a position where I have to determine is someone dangerous to himself or to society. And he may not be for 99.99% of his life. But for right now, that's something we have to do. Just want to clarify something I said earlier. Yes, um, insanity can be relative, but I think also there is sort of a scientific definition. I mean, there's like insanity in the relative terms, like we might think certain radical ideas in this time are like insane, or back in the day they might have thought radical ideas that are common today are more radical. Or insane. It's sort of like a morality in a way, I guess, because there's like parts of it that are relative, but there's also parts that are clearly defined. Because I'm saying that people who go around and uh, commit murders or deal drugs, things like that, they're not insane. They're not about to break down the society because we're built to deal with them. We have a law structure and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But there's people who are insane who, are, who have attempted to completely change that structure. The example I'm going to cite would be uh, Ted Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber. He wasn't out for anything other than attempting to change the society we live in. He was actually uh, trying not to improve things, but to, to break it down, to eliminate the technology and to stop the advance of too much technology, which he thought would result in a lot of problems, in far too many problems for me to explain right now. But he went against everything that was currently uh, agreed with at the time. He was, by definition of society, insane because he was out to eliminate everything that had been built up up to that point. Would we consider an entire society of cannibals insane? And if an entire society collectively agreed that this is the way we want to live? Is that insane? The idea of a society that is entirely cannibalistic, that is insane to me and probably insane to just about everyone else in this country, but um, I think that if it's pretty generally agreed that that's what the society does, I think that those were their customs and they deserve to be respected. And for that reason, I think that if I were to be in the society, I would say, yes, this is insane, I don't think this is such a great idea, but it's their ideas, I'm just going to let them do what they want. They're not going to harm anyone else but themselves. The way radicals uh, think in our mind is wrong, but to them, I think they think they're perfectly sane, and they, they are acting upon what they think is right. Mm -hmm. um, so. To us, outside looking in, we're not judging them, but in the same sense we are because our viewpoints not heads. Or should should we actively try to stop them from doing that? I mean, is there a, is our moral obligation to stop that or to respect it? I mean, if we knew of a pocket of people here in the United States that say that we're doing it, would we step in to stop it or say they have some right to do that? You talked about Ted Kaczynski, and my curiosity is whether you think his ideas or his behavior 
would classify him as insane? I think that his ideas probably would follow along most people as being a sort of, okay, I need to, I think that his actions by everyone else's definition would be, by society's definitions, would be insane. I think that following along what we consider to be right and what would advance us as a culture and as a people is insane. He was attempting to break it down. Presenting his ideas, simply writing about them, showing them to people, may not have been as insane because he was presenting them in a way that wouldn't affect society so harshly. In fact, it probably wouldn't have affected us at all because nobody was at that point willing to give up their technology. No one wanted to listen to what he had to say. And ultimately, he failed in his mission. Um, so yes, I would say that wholly, societally he was insane. Naturally, I can't say. Um, but morally, probably, in his mind, he thought he was doing something for the benefit. He was a humanist. He thought that he was doing it for the betterment of every human being because he thought eventually this would, that technology would revolt, result in human beings being uh, brought to the level of entertainment by technology. Uh, technology is going to advance to the point where all we live to do is to build new technology to make our lives easier so we can build new technologies They'll make our lives easier. He was trying to save people from that sort of thing. Morally, he was sane, I think, but his actions at the time that he was committing them were definitely insane. So just to go back to the point that Chad brought up, which was about if there is a society of cannibals, cannibals um, I think you have to, it goes back to the question I raised, and is, is sanity something that's universal? And yeah, and, and you're using your your scenario, I would say no, because there are certain societies in the South Pacific where cannibalism is a recognized part of how they organize their society, and they all agree to that, and that's normal behavior for them. <coughs> and if you were to suddenly transport those people into the middle of Michigan, you'd say, no, this is not sane by our standards. So I, I guess that would say then that sanity is is something that is relative. And kind of piggybacking on that is how do we transmit what we object what we as a group, as a society, agree upon as sanity or in insanity. And um I'm next on the list, so I'm going to say just a few things. Kind of back along the line of what both Nick and Chad were talking about, going back to my description about actions, we do draw the line when actions are disturbing either to individuals or more so to society. Um, that's, that's where our body of laws have come about, whereas we try to protect the majority of the people in society, and a lot of people get together to agree on what is sane or insane. But, you know, are there exceptions? We always hear about... Um, the artist going into rehab, you know, the, the entertainer, the singer, the actress, the actor. Do we promote a certain amount of insanity? You know, do we promote that person using drugs, alcohol, or whatever? What is off the picture in order to drive the, the benefit, the product of the entertainment that that person performs, are we actually pushing someone to be out of the realm of normal, out of the idea, and then how, did, how society responds, you know, that dictates what we call sane next year or the year after that. Okay, on the topic of um, the cannibalism, I believe that pretty much every instance of cannibalism, it's pretty much either been a survival or um, a ritual. Like death rituals, eat the heart of your enemy, or um, honor, honor a dead relative by eating their <coughs> flesh. It's pretty much all been death, death rituals and religious rituals. Okay. Or sacrificing people to gods and then eating them. So, and I guess within that society, that is considered normal and therefore not insane. This whole cannibalism thing was a really good, a really good thing to bring up because th this is this has happened. This is a very real thing that uh, there was a society in New and New Guinea years and years ago that would eat their dead 
uh, because they were honoring them, that sort of thing. And I would say that it's not very, I would say that what, why are we calling it insane is really the question we've got to ask. Why do we think that it's something insane? We're, I'm pretty sure that everyone is agreeing it's insane because of morals, as a moral insanity, because when you look at it, it's not destroying their society. They're not going to uh, affect their population unless, of course, it's going to cause them to become diseased and ill and die, which is what happened in New Guinea. But in that case, it would be, definitely be a negative. It would be insane. Morally, though, I don't see it as being insane. And then naturally, as long as, uh, once again, you know, death is a natural process, uh, cons consumption is a natural process, the only thing we're really arguing about, uh, or we're really discussing as what makes it insane is the moral aspect of it, which I think we can agree if they think that it's morally correct, if the people who died are think it's morally correct, then there should be no issue. Assume that majority of society is the cannibal group, and the minority is what we would be non-cannibals. Mm -hmm. How would we see the non-cannibals not participating in our customs or in our society? They would be the immoral ones um, for choosing not to partake in our, in our customs. A little tilt has happened in our conversation where we started off talking about sanity and some of my day-to-day -day work is steeped in descriptions of sanity, <coughs> and it's sort of shifted to sanity hand-in-hand yeah. hand with morality. So, you know, does morality play with the mind or with the heart figuratively? You know, is that a role? Because sanity can be both, you know, a, a disease, or not sanity, but insanity can be disease processes that are being further and further defined as electrochemical interactions, you know, um, problems with the brain and axon communication, and we are now able to address the things that made people insane a hundred years ago. Some of the fringe problems of those are now being addressed medically, are being addressed um, with behavior treatment, and sort of, you know, letting people have a little bit of mainstream behavior. And, you know, as a side set to that, is that acceptable? Is that natural? You know, some people say, I don't want to give my kids drugs to make him hy less hyperactive, because, you know, we didn't have those when we were growing up, and other people are like, I am tired of this scenario. If this is a legitimate diagnosis for my child, I want to have a medication. So, just kind of throwing those out as subtopics. Yeah, Nick. The only thing that's changed is that we know more and more and more about the brain. Mm -hmm. We've been an industrial society for a long time now, or at least long in terms of, we can't remember a time where we weren't an industrial society. We have more understanding of the way that different people are going to act. We have a better understanding of the way that we think the brain should work. Mm -hmm. And by our understanding, everyone should be able to have certain skills, be able to do certain things. But we're not really, no one has come forward to try and say at some point, maybe people are just born with a different kind of brain in the same way that people have different kinds of bodies, maybe they have different kinds of brains. Not your thought process, but your personality trait or personality disorder. And that's where humans begin to treat each other in different ways, like we talk about um, antisocial behavior, sociopathic behavior, uh, schizoid behavior, stuff like that. So that uh, you have to break down between whether some problem is an emotional disorder, that's a mood disorder, you know, you can add two and two and get four, but you're like, Rev high energy, you know, what was it, Charlie Sheen's interview? Yeah. Or you're, you know, you're dialed down depressed, that looks good. Yeah, or you can have normal or even flat emotions and have a thought disorder. You know, two and two equals, well, the queen was here yesterday, and that's why I got to kill the guy next door because there's soap scum in the soap dish. And there was a killer who was so nuts that he, if the soap scum was filled up in the soap dish, that was his message from the power of the bee that it was time to kill somebody. So that's quite edgy. <laughs> so, you know, that's again, we get back to the definition of what is normal, what is abnormal. Um, how do we deal with abnormality in society? Do we punish it? Do we restrict it? Do we applaud it? You know, the person, you know, what we do today were fanatically nutty ideas to people in the past. Women wearing pants. Mm -hmm. You know, um, heaven forbid that we don't eat our, our families, you know. So, I'm kind of reiterating a lot of what people have said. Do, do people have more comments or do they want to take it in a different direction? Um, I just want to 
Yeah, gotcha. I just wanted to finish up by saying I think that we need to think about where are we going to draw the line between somebody's just reclusive or twitchy or really, really neat, and where do we draw the line between they have a disorder that they need therapy for? Okay. I mean, it's pretty clear once we need medication, we're clearly in the point where this is a problem, mm -hmm. but when in, we need to know where to draw the line between someone who's just really, really like that and someone who is starting to need therapy to help okay. deal with an issue. And, and I, I agree. Greg, what were you going to say? Um, going, going once again back to the cannibalism thing, mm -hmm. I think it's more of an issue of we find it disgusting and therefore we don't do it, not we find it morally wrong, as so long as you don't kill people to eat them. Eating already dead people. I understand there's also the issue of it's not terribly good for you, I think that's any specific parts, I'm not, I'm not an expert, um, but I think it's, yeah, it's more that we find it disgusting. Yeah. Yeah, it's not good enough but and yet, I think it's, it comes to do, so why is, if it's causing harm, I think that's the point where right, and that's you've actually made what the I was, definition of morality, you know, when, when an action is causing harm, that's when it and, comes and to And I was going to talk, and then Sarah, and along those lines, yes, that's what I was going to say, is when it causes harm, there's from a morality standpoint, but also from a sanity standpoint. The person who is so withdrawn that he is not eating, he is not sleeping, he may not seek help, but often it's people who care about him who bring him to the attention of medical or psychiatric professionals. The person who is so bizarre in his behavior, he might paint it from purple and, you know, talk a million miles an hour. That's not a problem until he bars mom's car and drives it into a tree or bars mom, you know, spends his credit card beyond, beyond the limit and then goes out and gets another one. That's when, again, the actions become harmful to self or to others. You know, we all, how many people have said, oh, I hate, you know, I, I'm so mad I could kill so-and-so or I'm driving on the road and someone cuts me off. And I can have the potential for murderous rage. Would that punishment fit the crime? No, because I probably would have been killed miles back and cut somebody else off. But there are people who do not have the balance or the control, don't even consider that they need it. They go out, they act beyond that, and that's where we draw the line between sanity and insanity and where we as a society have to intervene. We have representatives do it for us, um, you know, police, medical professionals, stuff like that, and then we have courts help decide the criminality of it, but that's really an exception. There was a guy who um, shot a man because he didn't knock on the door. This guy was sitting in his yard, the plumber came, he walked into the yard, the, guy, the, the house, and, the guy, and he said, hey, I heard somebody here need a plumber. And the guy goes, go back and knock on the door. He's like, do you need a plumber or not? He says, go knock on the door. And the plumber's like, and walked out the door, but the guy took him out. So, you know, that qualifies as kind of insane in my book because, but, it, you know, was it insane to the guy who took him out? No, he probably thought, you know, this guy didn't knock on my door, I've taken him out. And he had, he had access to the materials that let him do it. You know, do we allow people with emotional disorders to purchase guns? Do we allow them to be parents? You know, there are, you know, I have, I have patients who are the children of people who are schizophrenic, someone who wasn't on medication who wouldn't even be able to be a parent at all, you know, and then is that right, is that wrong, what do you do when you go off the medication? So, again, more topics to throw out, Sarah was going to say something. I think that it's, you notice how almost no, it's only like very isolated and it's very rare to have cannibalistic societies. I think that we probably do have a natural aversion to mm -hmm. eating other people, just like we have a natural aversion to uh, interacting with waste products, yeah. human waste, Yeah. because Interacting with uh, the dead and waste is often an excellent way to get disease. And I would assume that people who weren't born with that natural aversion would have a high instance of getting sick and dying themselves. So, and does that select out for a population as well? Yes. So I think that would. Natural selection. Yeah. I think that would select out for people who had a strong aversion to interacting with um, dead, with the dead. I just want to follow on with what uh, Sarah said. Uh, interacting with the dead, and I think it used to be, I don't know, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, whenever it was, that well, we've, we've made death so clinical now that it's almost alien to us, and it's something that people are, are quite frightened of, and to be avoided at all costs. It's coming. And, um, sorry? It's coming. <laughs> yeah, yes, but uh, 
it used to be very common for people to die at home. Mm -hmm. It used to be very common for people to um, put their dead in the front parlor mm -hmm. so that that dead person was kept within the confines of the home and the family. And then the rest of the community could come through and pay their respects. And then that person was given a funeral and then buried. But now it's like you want to die in a hospital, you want somebody else to dispose of it. And I think that's kind of a shame. Okay. Because the more you place this kind of bubble around something that's going to happen to you anyway, I think the more you're not able to learn from the fact that you are going to die someday. I have another point, but to start with what Carol's talking about and the aversion to death and uh, how we're making it so clinical and something to pass on to other people to get done. There's a great documentary, if anyone's interested, it's called A Family Undertaking, and it's about some families in the United States that actually do the entire process themselves. Somebody dies, they, uh, mm -hmm. they clean them up, they dress them, they make it an entire family endeavor. They are taking care of the body of their relative, they're spending the entire time talking about them. It's a very, it's a, it's a very, um, it's a moment that brings them all very close together and brings them closer to the other person rather than just uh, somebody else takes care of it and then you mingle with a few people at the wake and then you watch the casket go on the ground and then you leave. Um, it's a very good documentary though if anybody wants to watch it but or if anybody's going to see it. The next point that I was going to make though is regarding the guy who shot the plumber. Um, I wouldn't say that he was insane. I th I still think that an overreaction to something does not immediately qualify you as being insane. It doesn't meet the specifications for what we can possibly call as being completely insane and, and uh, not meeting all of society's standards. If, if we went with that, I think that's just, we're, that by doing that we're calling murder um, the worst thing you can possibly do, which I still think is another thing that could be up for debate, but that just means we're, we have to define how important is murder to us mm -hmm. that we say that reaction, killing somebody, immediately qualifies you in saying that is that is the line that you are crossing. Um, if we were, if murder would never happened, if we were much calmer to the point where violence was never even happened, we could say that slapping somebody for taking something, yeah. there you are insane. You know, we've got to define first where that line is and if we think that murder is the ultimate crime then okay that's insane but it's all about society's definitions and I don't think that you can say that everybody who commits a crime a violent crime or kills somebody boom insane but going back to what Nick said about overreaction not necessarily being insane uh, I think it actually can be for instance Ned Pokey <laughs> that is not normal. That is very detrimental to society. People who go around punching people because they poke them or not knock on the door, that's not something that makes an awful lot of sense. It's not a violent crime that's committed for an understandable reason, like money or something like that. It's a violent crime that is committed because you have your own vision of how the world should be, and it, it, that can be somewhat insane at points. All I have to say, as far as uh, regarding Griffin, all I want to say though is, that is how you were raised. Though you're speaking, you're speaking not from an outside perspective, you're speaking from your morals that you were raised with. <clears throat> if you look at it from a blank, a blank slate, there is your morals are telling you that that's insane, that that reaction is. Somebody else may not. We can't, we can't look at it from a moral perspective right there before we can define what... Um, that is hard to explain properly, but all I can say really is that what you're saying is insane, that overreaction is according to your morals and what you think has been uh, considered right, and that if we look at it from somebody else's perspective, they may not say. They may say that, yes, if someone's going to poke you, if they're going to get inside your personal space, retaliate as you see fit. You know, if you're going to say that uh, 
survival of the fittest in literally every instance of your day. You have got to show somebody who's boss, you know? It may be acceptable somewhere else, and that we've got to figure out exactly where that line is as a society, and what's basically, ultimately, what it comes down to, what's going to allow our society to advance or fall back. Mm -hmm. And Riley, I think he's picking up where he left off. What was that? Uh, Sidetrack is, uh, through my career, um, as I mentioned, major, so I spent a lot of times with damaged children, um, a poke could send a kid off the wall, some child that's been abused all their life. Um, so to your mind, that is insane, but to them, that's a defense mechanism. Um, so to there, it's tip, it's completely normal for them because they're, they're, they're sane in their mind because they don't have, they didn't grow up in a, in a normal household. You were raised not to freak out or society raised you, that's... Like to exercise restraint. That yeah, I mean, but to them, they, society and their upcoming wasn't that way, so I think you go into a whole different individual being grown up um, mindset. Totally different debate. Well, of that, I'm going to start to bring this to a close. We've touched on a lot of interesting topics. It's funny <coughs> how one topic becomes many. Um, I think we're learning that philosophy is not just for the walled up institutions. Everybody can perform it anywhere in a gathering like this.